So yeah. thank you everyone for joining. Thank you to the Lagos Letter Fair and Ms. Olayabi for organizing this amazing event. Um, really excited to introduce Professor Yvonne Watson. As most of you may know, she's the Associate Professor and Director of Academic Affairs at Parsons, the new School of Design. I'm especially excited as an alumni of that school. Um, she's an innovative Associate Professor, a design thinker, an educator in design, fashion, textile, and educational curriculum. She's inspired by a vision for, a new, for new forms of curricular with emphasis on transformative learning, experiential and partner opportunities to improve mm -hmm. student, faculty and organizational outcomes. She's also quite involved in nonprofit work. I thought it was really interesting, capacity building for development of women entrepreneurs in places mm -hmm. such as Mongolia and Ethiopia. Um, she has experience in research design and really sort of um, focusing on elevation and impacting of various artisan communities. Um, in Peru, Mexico, Haiti, and Nepal. So welcome, Professor Watson. We're really excited to hear you speak on the mm -hmm. fundamentals of product design and development. And mm -hmm. we're gonna have a Q&A session after her, her um, presentation. So please feel free to leave um, your questions in the chat and we'll get to that after. So the floor is all yours, thank you. Okay, awesome, thank you. Um, <laughs> First of all, I'm, I'm going to share screen in a moment, but I just wanted to say uh, thank you um, for the uh, invitation. Uh, it really is a pleasure to be here. Um, and Femi, thank you so much for the, the opportunity. Um, Lani, it is also especially um, great to be introduced by you as a Parsons alumni. Um, uh, you know, we never take for granted who our alumni are. Um, and we know from that program, the quality of graduates uh, that um, exit from that. So um, it really isn't, it's my honor as well to be here. Um, okay, so I'm going to share screen and uh, then, okay. So can everybody see my, you can see my screen, Lani? Yes, I can. Okay, great. So um, uh, just to say, um, actually, since um, maybe you, you received my bio, my, uh, one of my titles has changed. So I was Director of Academic Affairs in the School of Fashion, uh, and I'm now Associate Dean for Curriculum and Learning. So uh, as, no, it's a slight, slight elevation, and it, uh, and it really just okay. is that, that you, everybody is up to date. That's all. Got it. Perfect. <laughs> no more than that. Um, so, um, yeah, so it, it's... Um, you know, this is a really great opportunity um, to have a discussion with you. So just consider that, you know, this is a conversation between us um, that will um, be in support of, you know, what your intentions are as, uh, you know, developing yourself as a designer. It really is, you know, my passion. Um, you know, I just remember being young and my mom, um, my, my parents, um, are both from Jamaica. I grew up in England. Um, so I grew up around um, a very powerful five foot, half an inch. <laughs> and please do not forget that half an inch. Extraordinary mother who um, I remember when she started to go to night school to learn how to make clothes. And for some reason, I don't even know why, but um, I remember her taking me to those classes. And I just got intrigued by the fact that you could create things that were flat, you would make something flat and then it would be three dimensional. So, you know, that was my kind of like starting point as, um, as, a, as a designer really. Uh, and I remember creating a project which was, I may have been around nine years old and it was called Fashion Conscious. And I remember, you know, cutting out things from a catalog and gluing them to a page um, and then my first garment that I ever made um, and I may have been about 12 when I did that which was a long kind of sleeveless garment with eyelets I remember all of these things so it's really you know as you think as a designer you know what is your process when you begin designer what are you inspired by and that could be anything from the natural environment from you know man-made structures to cultures and um, traditions so what i would say is what kind of designer you consider yourself to be 
that informs who your customer is. So I'm just going to put that in right at the top of our conversation. So it can begin with many different things. It may begin with how you um, relate to and think about color. Um, and it may be that, you know, you approach your design from the meaning or the texture or the pattern. Um, and so I always just, you know, want to include some examples of, you know, that as a, as a context, like, you know, this is a designer I've liked, you know, watching her development as a designer um, over the, the last few years. And as a designer, what she's inspired by, it's what she speaks about uh, are a couple of things, culture and tradition. Her mother is Haitian and her father is Italian. So in her design, she will always bring in, you know, something that is a reference to both you know, the Italian, so you see this in her, the, the stripe uh, formal shirt that she references as her father's and then the array of pattern and detail that she connects with um, her mother. And, um, you know, this is a, you know, a designer who, um, you know, I've come to know more recently, but his work for me is pretty inspirational. So one thing as well um, that you may not know is that um, my training was that of a knitwear designer. So when I studied at college, what I was interested in was fabric and making of the fabric. So to, to see, um, I remember when his first collection came out and I was just like, wow, inspired by it because it speaks to tradition, but it also speaks to culture um, as well. So there are many ways that um, you know, when you are thinking about, when you are um, exploring design, you may have multiple access points and um, avenues for, for your kind of um, initi initial approach. And it can be like you can see here, it can be man-made, it can be, you know, this kind of the technical work of uh, the designer um, Aris van Herpen, who is really inspired by uh, technology. It can be, um, you know, the kind of natural forms and the beauty of what you can see uh, around you. Um, what I see most often is that designers are often inspired by the most ordinary um, and mundane things, simple things. Um, and so one of the things that I promote, um, you know, as a design process is, you know, use what you have at hand. So for me, that is my, right now, it's my phone. Um, I'm super interested in the um, AT&T have just let me know that I can upgrade. Um, so the iPhone 12 is really interesting to me because it, and the main thing, it has an amazing camera. And I use that to just keep track of things that are um, interesting to me that I can keep going back to. And that's objects, colors, textures, all the things that you can retain for um, further use. So this is me in, um, you know, in the, uh, the building, the Oculus, which is an extraordinary um, monument. Um, it is where uh, the Twin Towers were, but you know, this is just me with my phone and all of this is inspiration, inspiration. It is form, it is um, texture, it is color, it is line. It's all of the elements of design. Um, and what I want to um, kind of like really invite you to think about is it doesn't have to be hard or challenging. It really can just be organic. You know, so where where do you begin? Again, here, um, this was, these are all images from my phone. So these are things that could be for color inspiration, for texture. Um, and one of the things as a designer and as a design educator, um, all that we promote principally are ways of looking. And in the ways of looking, we're promoting that there are alternative ways. I could look at this image and I will extract something different for, from the other person. And as, as that educator, we are really only cultivating those ways of, of looking. 
Um, for me, I'm always particularly inspired by um, the man-made and some of these pieces are from an artist, um, uh, Andy Goldsworthy. And I just really love how he uses the simplicity of organic materials. And then where do you go from there? You consider your concept board and um, there are different ways that um, designers approach that. You know, there's the, the very traditional analog way, which is to have, you know, a pin board in your studio or in your space that you just put everything on that is a kind of like a train of thought. It is a process of um, whittling down, editing and re re refining. And it really is that you are bringing, you know, a, a mass of information and narrowing it down to a key intention. And I've shared this before. This is a with a group of uh, women that I presented to. Uh, this was um, um, a moment when I was in Haiti with a team um, that was working on a project with Donna Karen. So this was her board. You know, I took some photographs. This was her way of communicating. These are the things that I'm interested in. Uh, the students were working with the various artisan communities that she has familiarized herself with and works with in Haiti. So there's the horn person, there's the leather person. Uh, there's a wonderful woman that she works with that is um, ceramics. So it's identifying your intention and then narrowing that down so that you can start to work on the product development, like funneling things through so you can say, well, I'm looking at this in this particular material and we'll talk a little bit about materiality. It is a core um, area of my work and what I'm always interested in. So your mood board, and then there are other ways that you could um, work on a mood board as well. So this is one where it's a online format where you can keep your mood board as a digital space where you can divide things up, where you can have photos, you can have colors and textures, you can have graphics, you can put everything together in different ways and then look at them, you know, from afar um, as well. So as I was saying, inspiration and starting points, they may be your own personal approach, your own preferences. Um, it can be in, in terms of form, it can be uh, architecture, it can be natural form, um, you know, and as I've said, it can be cultures um, as well, like your own local culture. Um, I think it's always important to, to look where you are and observe from there and look and see like what is it that you really want to you own it it's your local culture so you know work from work from there and have that really be your inspiration and then of course the next piece is well how do you go about the translation and you know that is part of the the interesting challenge when you are looking at your materials so you can see here the um, inspiration and then how this is carried through into product development. So I want to stop and just say a little bit about brand and your brand development and defining your USP, your unique selling point as a brand. I think most often we do product development and then we kind of think about the brand or we think about, um, you know, things in kind of like different buckets um, in a way. But what I've started to really understand more for myself is that your brand and your USP begins with all of the things that I've described, um, you know, in this preamble. It really begins with your inspiration like there are different kinds of touch points as you are developing your brand and defining your unique selling point that are integral to the ways that you think about your inspiration your starting point how all of those things are generated are all of the things that become kind of like the ingredients for your brand whether it is that you love a certain type of um, material you know, that you want to work with leather or that, you know, it's fabric or it's wire or it's wood. All of those things become part of, you know, your kind of like um, 
catalog of of um, of uh, aspects of tools of um, elements that you really want to then start to utilize as you are also defining your brand. And then, of course, how does this layer into who your customer is um, as well? Because I think sometimes we can, um, you know, I don't want as for people to think that as a design educator, we're only um, focusing on what you make and how you make it. We do. We have a high emphasis on that, but we're also cognizant of um, sometimes you want to be thinking uh, about, well, who, who is going to be the purchaser of this? And sometimes as you are thinking about product, you're also considering persona of a, a customer. So this was something um, I worked on previously. I was working on an idea uh, for a brand and I was looking at, okay, so who is the, who is the woman? It was a, I was working with a research student and we were starting to look at, well, who is buying artisan craft-based products? And so we were looking at, yep, yeah, it's mostly women. You know, we, the age bracket, it's kind of there or thereabouts, you know, give, a, give or take a little bit. We can say that there is something in terms of income um, that they have as well. Um, we can create like an overview. We can say where they like to shop, what they tend to spend and, and kind of like who they are influenced by. Now we need to link all of that back to the product. What will engage them are all of the things that you have started with inside of your inspiration um, and inside of like all of the kind of premise of um, you know, the material product development, um, you know, and how all of those things are um, synthesized. So if you think back to those earlier images of, you know, Stella Jean and La Duma, you know, I, I, I'm not sure, you know, in those instances, sometimes which comes first. I think sometimes it's the inspiration and the the, the development, the product development, and then the customer is found. Either way, you know, at some point, you know, there is an opportunity to synthesize, synthesize those things, like to suture that together so that there is a clarity. So, you know, there are things that we can see that are recognizable um, ways that we know and understand a brand. And all of those things, if you say Chanel or Gucci, it already is evocative of something. And so in the brand, you know, you are describing in a sentence in one paragraph or two to three paragraphs, you're describing what the brand is, what the manifesto is, and you're using emotive language. That is the rallying cry of the brand. It is what inspires partners and it is what inspires customers so that they buy into the brand goal. All of those things come from what your starting point is, what your inspiration is, uh, what the color is, what the texture is. All of those things are what feed into what becomes the brand. And so just a couple of other examples, Dries van Noten and, and um, Prada, and I just choose those because those are um, particular favorites of mine. I love that Dries van Noten um, is very textiles orientated. Um, and, you know, he's one of those brands that I'm like aspirationally, yes, I would love to, you know, wear um, pieces from his collection. But it really is that all of who he is as a designer is emphasized in the development of the brand, the emotion of the brand. Uh, it's em exemplified, amplified in the way that they use color, the way that they use texture. So Prada, Miu Miu, um, again, another brand that I always really enjoy, but I enjoy Prada and Miu Miu because the way that they use color is always, I would say, unusual and, you know, and sometimes kind of kooky, but there's something about it that works. And then that works for the customer for which that works. So, um, mission statement again it all comes back to the product the product development so here we can see with nike what they say is there's an athlete in everyone that's a core value 
How do they achieve that is a key value proposition. And, you know, why they make what they do is the product. So all of these things ladder up into, you know, what is the, the, pro the product? And then you have the branding, you're understanding what the problem is, you're creating the product statement, you, you clearly outline what, is, what are your beliefs and values. And all of those things now become even more important in your product development, particularly in a context, in a moment when folks are speaking about transparency and sustainability, where does the materials come from? Um, you know, what are the different touch points? Who made it? How did they make it? Where were the materials sourced from? All of those things now are stitched into, you know, what is the brand? So the brand and the product are kind of like indivisible. Like those are, those are things that are coupled together that create the brand personality and voice. And so I've talked a little bit about color and those are, you know, that's the, the way in which it is the most um, obvious way that somebody has intro and access to what your um, brand is and how you use color, just in the way that I talked about Dries van Noten and um, Prada. And then the materiality, the starting point, what is your product made from? That will say something about who will be interested in purchasing how is it made? Where is it made? And so um, for this piece, I wanted to um, fold in here, um, you know, another part of like, kind of like my past life. Um, so before I moved to New York, I had worked in the UK education system for many years, I think 15 years plus probably at that point. And one of my uh, roles, I was, um, the head of the Department of Fashion and Textiles at the University of Northampton. It's a small university that grew out of being a tertiary college, but what was really interesting and unique about this particular institution was that they had a leather school. Um, it, you know, it's, it has a slightly different title now, but when I arrived there, what was interesting was that we had as a, um, the head of fashion and textiles, we had a fashion design program with a heavy emphasis on textiles and printing. We had an accessories program uh, with uh, shoes and um, uh, general accessories, handbags and other accessories. We had a really deep connection with uh, traditional uh, shoemaking in Northampton. So we were supported by uh, churches and I went up to the leather school and I asked, why are the fashion design students not in here making leather and designing? And, um, you know, whatever those histories were, we kind of like worked it out. And then we started to work with the leather school on designing and creating um, fabric. So the leather school had been very focused on um, the sort of a, the a leather technology so the testing of leather, the, the, um, the development of leather, all of the kind of new trends in um, whether it was uh, leather from Ethiopia or Chennai in India or um, veg tan leather, which became very popular um, as well. Um, but we started to work with them. So here, now this is where materiality and products start to kind of come together. So I saw all these really great machines. I was like, we need to be using that. Paul Smith did some of his um, leather testing and leather designing at the leather school as well. And so I was like, if it's good enough for him, it's good enough for my students. So this is what we did. We started to work with them. We um, used their um, technology. We used, uh, th these are um, embossing. So how can you emboss onto leather? And then we did, um, this was a student who worked on carving and then she laid the, the leather on top of that so you would get an impression um, from the leather into the leather, pressed into the leather. Now, all of this is all inside of design, development, product development, and it, it synthesizes 
everything that is about the elements of design. These are core elements of design. So line, shape, direction, size, texture, color, value, core. And then the principles of design like pattern, contrast, emphasis, all of those things are the undertone, the foundational element for core pieces that are about design. So in the materiality process, you know, it really is about how do you go about organizing those principles? How do those come into form, shape, silhouette, color, um, etc.? So here we have, you know, this was the last time actually I, I was at the school. I visited in 2014. Um, so my photograph tells me that. So here, this is the hydraulic embossing machine press. So this, um, I don't know if you can read it clearly. So using very high pressure, the leather is pressed against a heated smooth plate to give gloss, also causing the finish to run out, forming a continuous layer as opposed to, to lots of tiny particles. So this is the thing that, you know, engraved plates to emboss artificial grain patterns, crocodile, goat, lizard, all of these textures. So you look at this old grimy machine, but this could do like amazing and wonderful things such as this. This is an example of like what that, um, that technology can do. I'm also a big proponent of how do you use the technology and technology is technology. There's old technology. Like I said, this is an old piece of machinery and there's new technology, 3D printing, laser cutting, all of these things that all support and amplify um, product development. So another example. So what we set up were a series of workshops where students would go to um, the leather school and they would um, test things out. Initially, what we did was we had all the students do a rotation through the leather school. And then we focused on those students um, at a higher level who were leather um, focused, leather orientated. So this was a student, Jane Nutt. And um, uh, she came from the town. She had been somebody who had worked in traditional leather in the, um, in the uh, traditional factories like churches, lobs, chinis, hand-stitched uh, leather um, goods. Um, and, you know, this was, you know, great work that she did on forming leather, dyeing leather, um, over-dyeing leather, bringing different things together. So all of this is inside of, you know, how you go about product development. So you can see here is the preparation using all of those things that I talked about at the beginning, what is your interest? Is it natural um, or man-made? So here we have like all of these natural elements that are being now used as part of the design process, the design development process. Um, I talked about color um, as well. And, you know, there are the traditional understandings of color. And we have the example of, you know, Prada, Miu Miu, Dries van Notem the non-traditional uses of color. But again, thinking about color in terms of your immediate environment, uh, the, the, the kind of quality of light that you have informs, you know, your thinking and understanding and relationship to color and how you use it in design then becomes, you know, an incredible resource as well. Um, so a resource is something like um, Pantone, and you can find them obviously online, and then you can use their booklets um, as well. And each year they bring out a, a color. And it seems as though for 2020, this is probably the best color, the blue, because it has been a blue year in so many different ways. Like we got the blues uh, this particular year. Um, and um, I, I always like to just reference, you know, Femi handbags, um, um, because in a way it, um, for me, I, I know when I first came across um, Femi handbags at one of the trade shows through ITC, I was really struck by, you know, the bold use of color. 
And so this for me is a really nice example. So if you look at here, I love like just this tiny this tinge of orange, but if you look over here, how the orange comes over here as well, the balance and the relationship. For me, I see all of the things that are about the principle and the elements of design in, in a just a wonderfully um, unique um, kind of union. And then this is an example of um, Studio 189. Um, they are a brand, uh, they are New York based. Um, they do a lot of their work and development, product development uh, in Ghana. And what is just, you know, wonderful again is it is about their approach to material, materiality, and, um, and again, that use of color. So what you can see here is the, the various different hues, values, and tones that are all in relation to blue in different ways and how they use the analogous colors as well in relationship. So again, your color and how you use color, it becomes everything because it becomes how your brand is identified from your labeling, um, you know, from the ways in which you use um, the tags in your garments, in your products, etc. Those things become, you know, identifiable markers. And again, um, bring it back to um, La Duma. Really, just again, I just love how um, the thoughtfulness, the background color, the relationships, and you could see every piece here is slightly different, but the tone and the way everything hangs together is um, just thoughtful and just I, I, beautiful is what I can say. Just a really beautiful relationship. And so, you know, just again, taking this back to um, leather. So here is an example. This is the kind of work the students would do. They would test things. They would do crazy things like you can do tie dye in fabric. OK, let me see if I can do tie dye in leather. This is them trying these different things out. So I've said um, a little bit um, about color. It's an emotive subject. How you use it becomes, um, you know, a critical part of the relationship. So here we can see different skins, um, different ways that um, through in the leather school, we were able to do these things. We were able to um, work inventively with the technician. There was a, a guy there, Dave, who had been there for many years and there was nothing that, um, you know, he was unwilling. He would be like, well, I don't know how we will do that, but let's try, let's try that. So printing, embossing, spraying the leather. So here is the, the this is how they do it. They have the, the um, this area here um, where you can spray the skins, you know, just doing amazing, um, amazing work. So again, this, these are some examples from what the students had worked on, um, scoring the leather, the leather um, um, embossing into the leather, um, spraying different kinds of finishes um, as well. Um, and uh, this is the machine where they buff the leather, like they shine it and, um, you know, they think about like the quality of the skin. So there are many different things that, as part of the design development process that are very critical to how the leather itself is, you know, an integral part of the design development um, process. Okay. So I'm coming to my final slides and then we'll have some time for some uh, Q&A. Uh, so this is some student work uh, where she had used like a snakeskin fabric um, um, and then uh, different ways that she had pieced together the leather, different kinds of finishings that she had used here in the, the kind of forming of this. And here in this shoe as well, uh, this was like a, um, a toned leather um, as well, where she had used, again, this kind of like color spray uh, detail. 
We were also very well known at Northampton for leather clothing as well. Um, so in, in Northampton, um, the, it is also known, and we're very close to Silverstone, uh, which is where um, they do Formula One racing. So leather is, the whole town is focused on leather. So, you know, here you, you can see the kind of like quilted effect of the leather. And this was one of my like favorite pieces, dynamic, this is all leather. And you can see it is form, it is silhouette. Um, there's the kind of the finish of the of the of the the leather as well, and it was just a really um, you know awesome and beautiful piece of, of of work. So I think that's the end of my slide. So and that's a little bit about like um, Northampton and what they do and what they can provide. And I'm happy to speak a little bit more um, on that um, as well. Okay. So we have time for some questions. Yes, thank you so much. That was really insightful, the visuals. I love that you were, I mean, you just talk about so many different things. And I think to just see, um, especially the visuals of process, uh, the materials, everything, um, mm -hmm. concept, and the work that was you know, done at um, uh, Nottingham, that was also quite interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that we have a question here, just an mm -hmm. interesting one. That, uh, can, you, can you see the chat? Are you able to see the chat? I can. Uh, there is something about, uh, have you heard about artists using Bitcoin as a way to highlight their heart, art? And has that been more helpful or a hindrance? And I'm, I'm not a... I'm not familiar with Bitcoin, um, so I'm not clear. Is it about the way that they're using Bitcoin to sell their art, or I'm not I'm not clear about the question. Yeah, no, yeah. I was also um, a little unsure. Um, we can, if you can, please sort of elaborate on that. I think that was from Rosemary. That would be helpful. Um, but you said you were you. The last thing you said, which I thought was quite interesting, you said you'd be open to sharing more about the work that was done at the university. I think that's something that a lot of people will find quite fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's amazing um, what you were able to do when you were there and bring yes. in the passion and product design, um, yes. the technology, and yes. create such strong synergy. You know, I think that's it's mm -hmm. such a it's something that we really need a lot of times. You know, to have that experimental um, yes. approach that we can really create something innovative as opposed to just kind of replicating what's already done, right? So mm -hmm. I, I was, I really, really uh, yeah. value that. I, I think um, that that point that you've made is the, is the critical one. And the critical one, I think, is that uh, as, a, as the takeaway. And it is, you know, it's kind of what I was pointing back to when I said, you know, my role as design educator is to support students in new ways of looking. And, and it is that, and I would say that what I have noticed when I've been working with, you know, mainly uh, hand worker based communities, uh, they, they have less um, access to, to wider ways of looking because what they're familiar with is what they're familiar with. They're familiar with that cloth or they're familiar with that process. And so of course, now when you start to uh, you know, develop yourself as a designer and you, you're in the same vein and, as you said, replicating the same thing, it is hard to break out and be innovative and to look newly and differently at things. And it means that you often have to take a risk as well until you find who your customer is. And, I, you know, I did have an opportunity, uh, Lani, to take a look at some of your work. Um, as well and it was gorgeous like Thank really you. stunning so I'd love to know like you know how have you been identifying your customers and you know what have you been using as your materials as well because that is the I would say that is the key to the whole piece of this developing yourself creating the materials extending yourself in such a way to be innovative. What I love about 
when I when we did the work at um, Northampton was it gave students such a wide palette to be able to play with. And we were able to do it at Parsons as well, something slightly similar. We worked with a, um, a, uh, fa a footwear uh, shoe design school in Milan. Um, was it called Milano Polytechnic? Polytechnic, I forget the name of it, but for the same reason, how can you collaborate and really expand your, your repertoire? It's so crucial to be able to do that. It is what will set you apart in regard to finding your sweet spot. Yeah. So um, it, was, it was really nice to see your work. Thank you so much. Um, you know, when you said ways of looking, yeah. that really hit home. <laughs> because I mean, a lot of what I do is about sort of leaning back in some ways, leaning back, looking at our culture, looking at our heritage, in order to kind of try to envision what, you know, what would be, what is, what is appreciated now, but also timeless, you know, something that is, you know, mm. timeless, you know, future and also works in the future. And yeah. um, I have a collection called the Talking Stills Collection. And when you were talking about the work you were doing, um, it kind of just reminded me a little bit of that because it's basically, it was inspired by um, the maps. It is a map within community. Um, and I was very much interested in sort of um, sustainable materials. And you have this maps that they've been weaving for decades, a women, women, women's collective, but you know, you, people are not buying the mats, you know, people don't consider, consider them too traditional, right? And you can't force people to buy what they don't want to buy, right? So for me, I've always felt like design is a tool, right? And designers are mediators, right? And so I was thinking, okay, how do you take something like this, which is beautiful and it's, it's something that has you know, it's our heritage and it's the craftsmanship is quite amazing. How do you extend this product into a different use? How do you reimagine this product? So like you were saying, ways of looking, you know, I never thought of it like that until you kind, you've kind of almost given me the words to articulate some of these things that I've been sort of, um, sort, of, sort of bubbling in my head. And so basically we started to create stools with this yes. map and started to use the mat as upholstery uh, material and when we started making it, so, you know, like you were saying, a lot of different artisan communities um, are kind of um, sort of a focus on how they've been working for many, many years, right? And so when I wanted to make this, um, make furniture pieces with the mats, it was tricky to find folks to work with because they were like, this is not a material, you know? And I actually started making it myself and in making it myself, it started to look like a shoe. And then I started to reach out to shoemakers and now I actually make these stools with folks who, make, who, who, make, who actually were trained to make shoes because they understood that sculptural sensibility and these are stools and they understood how to work with leather, you know? And so it's been a very interesting process mm -hmm. you know, working with folks that work um, shoemakers and cobblers and creating, mm -hmm. and now we work with furniture. So that idea of sort of um, not limiting ourselves as designers or creators to sort of the roles or the sort of um, placeholders, you know, it doesn't have to be the person that sings, it doesn't have to be the furniture maker, it can be someone in a different industry, right. sort of benchmarking and creating synergy and collaboration. So I really yeah. love what you said and it kind of made me think yeah. a little about that. I think okay, that's, so a, that's, that's, a really, that's a really excellent, a really excellent point because it is about how do you uh, one of the things I'm also interested in is how do you leverage um, the resources that are in your local, you know, in your ecosystem, right? you know, and that you can create, you know, we've been talking about how can you create an active supply chain exactly. and integrate different people into that supply chain. It is looking at where are those traditional skills, where do they lie and how can those be leveraged? And I, I say that very, very specifically because I've seen way too many ex, um, um, examples of where people come from outside right. into um, you know, the, the places that where you work and they do have the ability to, they've got that purview and they take what you know, they see as those resources and leverage that and 
you know, make, you know, a lot of money from that. I, I, today I was going to put on, I have a, one of those, uh, is it called Curry Kenya? It's a, one of those dresses, you know, um, and I thought, no, I'm not going to put that, put it on today. <laughs> but, you know, that they just went to Kenya. They make one dress. Essentially, it's just one dress. Right, right. The traditional fabric. They sell right. it here in Brooklyn. No, in, uh, sorry, in Manhattan in a tiny store. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and they have they have they have leveraged a very decent business now you right. know so use you've got to start to look newly at your own material resources that will show you ways i believe to think differently in terms of what is sustainable how do you sustain you know your cultures and communities yeah i mean just so well said i, I I, I don't even know what else to say because it's it's basically everything that um, um, I think is is crucial more than ever, right? Um, we do have some questions. Um, yeah. I can I kind of see it now in the Q and A um, session. Um, oh yes, please. Q and A session too. Yes, I can see it now. Okay, so I didn't know if you going to start with one of them. There's okay. Of yes, I was looking. I was looking in the chat and not in this in the. <laughs> the Q&A. Um, how do I leverage on other people's work to channel my inner creativity? Um, you know what? So I would say from that, um, it is always important that you know what is happening. And there are many ways that you can have access to that today, you know, whether it's on your phone, you know, and that is like, if you are in fashion, you keep abreast of what is happening internationally simply by you know looking at what is happening on um, i don't know vogue.com because they're always in your backyard i promise you they're always in your backyard wgsn or any of those kind of trend places trend tablet with lee edelcourt they are always coming to your places to look for trend and inspiration so you need to be looking at what they are looking for where they are looking that is that I would say that was what I would say is critical. You don't need to be looking at those people to replicate what they're doing, but you need to look and see, oh, um, this, this brand, um, they're coming to Nigeria and they're looking at, um, you know, fashion in this area. Be alert and be aware of those things so that you can keep the edge on what you are doing. There is a lot of focus. I've been following just informally um, mm -hmm. the various ways that fashion has been looking in looking into Africa for um, you know a number of years now. So when Francesca Sozani in um, Vogue Italia featured uh, you know uh, African design and when she did the the the, the black vogue um, um, issue and everybody went wild and it was on their platform. You need to be making sure that you know what is happening. So I urge you to keep looking, um, looking there. Um, and then another question is, um, okay. On platform to use in creating a mood board. Yes. Um, I have, um, there is a, there is a link there are there are many different ones but there was one actually let me see if i can find the link to it uh, okay this this is one i would suggest there is one called sparkle collage it's an adobe uh, spark spark sorry spark adobe.com i um i use this and i um i i I set projects for my students to do this. Um, some of it is um, easily usable and you can bring together different ideas. You can collage them together. It's like a collage tool. It's really lovely. They also have a library and you can pull images from there um, as well. So really great. So um, I would try um, spark um, um, about adobe.com. And thank and you then, for the chat. So just to like mention, she's put, she's she's nice enough to write it out in the chat so you can take a look at that. Yes, definitely. Um, 
question. Do you want to just ask the next question? I'm just going yes, to look for something. Is it encourageable to use other designers' works, for instance, Benny handbags, as inspiration on your mood board? Would you advise this for a new designer? It, it is a little bit like I, I was saying, you know, in for the other for the other example, um, it is it is, you know, sometimes I think it's hard not to look. The difference is you can look most definitely, but you shouldn't copy. Exactly. <laughs> you can look. My no, problem, no problem with looking. Everybody should look. Yeah. yeah? Absolutely, but you've got to find your own access. We see it all the time. We see so many designers where, you know, you know they took their idea from this next designer or that next designer. And, you know, it's not, not the way I've trained my students, but they often they'll go into the industry and that is what they do. Right. It is an it is a really unfortunate part of the um, the industry because we train them not to do that. We train them to be original, and it has been just how design has been. That you know, you go on uh, what do they call them? Like trend shop things. I used to remember this when I was a student myself, and um, you know, people would go to Pitifilati in in Florence. And then they would go and buy things as well. And then of course, when you buy things and you, if you are in the US and then you travel back, then those things, they either, um, they either you, you, to get them through customs, what you have to do is you have to damage them. You literally have to cut them up so that you can claim that they are samples and that they are not um, products that you are going to sell or something along those lines. So you go and you buy this amazing, beautiful sweater. And then what you've got to do is you've got to, to get it through customs, you've got to cut the arm off or cut a big hole. In. And that's what we used to do. You would cut the garment up and then say, send that to China and say, we want you to make that. Wow. That is quite fascinating. <laughs> it's, it is the way that it has been, but you know, I'm hoping for a, a, at some point, a different future in design that is beyond that. So please be inspired by um, Femi handbags by all means. Yes, be inspired by each other, um, but find your own voice. It is really critical that you find your own voice. I put the other link in as well. One is Spark Adobe and the other one is mural, mural.co for how you can do um, design boards, concept and boards. Want, and I just wanna add, just add on to Think about what you said, you know, to the person who asked, if I may, um, so the, in terms of new designers, you know, I think this was, she just honestly just gave such an amazing roadmap in terms of process, concept design, cataloging inspiration. And if you're, you know, if you're able to take those strong key takeaways, then you, um, you would, you would sort of, you would sort of figure out and sort of go on an adventure to discover your own identity and your own design as opposed to focusing mm -hmm. on what other designers are doing because if yes. you focus on what other designers are doing you're going to get lost in the in the in the in the in the sort of beautiful chaos of everything you know as opposed to trying to carve your own path right? For sure. And, you know, and Lani, I mean, I think even your example that you gave is, is an example of that's what it actually looks like to, um, to, to find your own path. So you saw this map, you saw something in that, that was unique and, you know, beautiful that you wanted to kind of explore. And then from there, you could see, okay, well, they're not interested in weaving that, but there's this, and I'm gonna take this to the, the people who would do shoes because when you make shoes, what you have to understand is I can get in, in a stool because you cut, you, you know, you have the foot and you cover that. And then yeah. you have to, you know, trim it in certain ways because it's got to fold over something. It's got to fold over a foot. So then you, the, your research, that's you going out and doing the research to understand, oh, wow, that's a new product right there. 
from you looking newly. So it's, it is crucial. Yeah, I think there was somebody who had a hand up as well. Oh, okay. Um, They've answered all the questions. Um, yeah. Did, did I miss any questions? I'm not... I think uh, we've all the questions that were in Q and A, we've answered. Yeah, okay. Mood board, okay. yeah. Okay, yeah. So I think we didn't miss, we, we haven't missed any questions, no. Okay. No. But, but I thought somebody put their hand up and I I couldn't... see that, but I, I'm not really sure what that... Um... They might have given a high five, maybe. <laughs> high five. Um, <laughs> and, and Rosemary, I, your question about Bitcoin and um, Ethereum in the US, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I just did a quick Google search of Ethereum and it's that that's not an area that I have an expertise in, in terms of how people are using um, some of those systems uh, right now. I wanted to also just um, go back to something you mentioned, which again mm. ties into the question that um, this young um, designer asked and you said, don't be afraid to take risks. Oh, yes. And, and I think that's something that, I mean, that, that's the advice right there for young designers. <laughs> also, don't be afraid to take risks. One thing that a professor told me at Parsons one time um, was when you start a journey, especially in creativity and everything, if you already know where you're going before you started, you've already failed, right? right? So when you said that, it just kind of reminded me about that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it is. I, I, and it's, I would say the same thing when I'm working with thesis students. And if you imagine you're working on your capstone and you have all of this time to be able to develop and think about it. Um, but if you're going to, if you already know what you're going to make, there's no research in that. There's no development. There's no risk in that. If you already know what you're going to make, you have not even allowed yourself to go through that, the process of discovery, because, you know, I always talk about, you know, research and it's, it's like a diamond. So you start off, you know, going wide and then you start to narrow back in, but you got to allow yourself to go wide. If you're going to start here and just make here, then that's what's going to happen. You, you know how to make this thing in this time, in this way, there's very little more that you can do with that. Yeah. And then you, before you know it, you get stuck in your own rut. Exactly. You limit your growth, discovery, yeah. everything. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this person has put their hand up again. So Gil. Gil oh, there's another question. I just popped up too. Okay. As an upcoming aspiring designer, how mm -hmm. do you get manufacturers? I have my own designs, but getting a manufacturer to make my bags is hard, especially on a small scale. Yeah, um, that is, uh, I think that is the key thing that is often a barrier. But I think, you know, what you do, you do what Lani did. <laughs> you go and start to look for uh, you know what you have uh, well I've not been to Nigeria I've been to Senegal so I'm, I'm 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 not and I'm not saying that Senegal is Nigeria but you have deep traditions in terms of making right and um you know I have a, a really um I have a somebody a young man that I mentor who's from Ghana and um he he posted that the other day he's working on something but what did he do he got on his WhatsApp with his tailor back in Ghana to say, okay. how should I go, go find somebody who, you know, you can do at least your sample with and, yeah. and then start to build your build, you know, your kind of like library and then build a resource that is around you. And then if you start to do things that then, you know, expand, then you can look at, you know, how, how might you move that into either, I don't know, a small cooperative or, but some of this, you've got to build by personal connection and by personal relationships, how yeah. you start 
build up build up those personal relationships and then if it gets big then you may want to go to different places if it's you want to do you know good quality uh leather um bags or whatever it is then maybe you want to go to italy and then if you want to do something that is more mass then maybe you would go to china for production for you know for your manufacturing but if you are um starting and find out who has the expertise in your locality like who's around you and don't cut off that maybe it could be your tailor or right. whatever <laughs> like your local tailor that you could start to develop a relationship with yeah that i think that that's um yeah especially we have like you said you know various makers and artists and communities um it definitely does get tricky when one thinks about scale and that's why you mentioned right. you know, things um but like yeah i think like prototyping starting with what you what you have no matter how small mm -hmm. um it's better to make those mistakes at a very small scale that's right <laughs> you know? Abs absolutely and you will for you to go to a manufacturer you know um you still need to know the steps yourself if you are going to be sourcing something if you're going to be outsourcing your production you've got to be able to be to be able to tell somebody i need the zip putting in like this i need mm -hmm. this to be like this you need to have all of the the details so that you can actually communicate that to somebody so you actually get back what you want and that it actually looks like the thing that you want as well you know so you got to get very um very skilled at you know understanding all of the nuances of your product to be able to you know convey that to another person and then to have like real ownership of you send it out for um production you got to know all parts of it you know we did a workshop i i had a young woman it was a parson's graduate um um do a, a a presentation at one of the um uh presentations i did with itc and you know when you listen to her she talk, she she can make it herself she can make the whole of it now if she has to send it out she sends it out her te tech pack is clear she can send a sample she say i want the stitch like this i want it like you know two thread or three whatever it is she has everything all the pieces so that what comes back is exactly what she requires mm. so that's that's kind of what i'd say yeah i think it's interesting what you said this also like you might not you i mean might not always to make it but understanding the know how um taking classes sometimes so you can like don't be afraid to get your hands dirty right um mm -hmm. i work a lot with metal so i actually took some metal classes um yeah. i knew i wasn't going to be able to make the stuff <laughs> that i wanted to make but i yeah. needed to i i didn't study product design so i didn't have fabrication know how but i took the metal classes to just be able to kind of get some basic foundational stuff of yeah. how to manipulate metal how metal actually works and stuff and i yeah. found it quite helpful really because then when you work with people that are actually experts then you speak their language you know the limitations of stuff mhm mm so i think there's a comment also in the not should i read it out not so much yeah. as a question as an affirmation of what you want to say I worked as a designer in the 70s and 80s. Okay, that was Gil that was really raising up her hand. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so yeah. So she said she worked as a designer in the 70s and 80s in UK and was restrained in a way um but she has been in Ghana for 30 years using local beads and brass for fittings and decorations. She was really inspired by Kofianta in 90 in the 90s to mm. expand and use her use her skill to add to what is around her. So she's agreeing and affirming everything you're saying about what you hold hold together. Yeah, and it's great. I'm just looking so Kofi answer isn't somebody that I'm I've been familiar with and I love also when I get to know about uh different people and what I what I can see is um here the one what I'm looking at that 
I'm, I'm drawn to is um, where he was using uh, like the African mud cloth. And it, mm. again, it is the, the, the materiality. That's the, you know, that's the starting point. Yeah, this is, this is great. You know, because when you see other, um, you know, there's such a lot of, um, you know, appropriation and mm. it is, it is a fine craft. It is a, um, you know, it is a, a deep tradition that has a relationship to, you know, people's culture and land and history and tradition. Um, and I love when I can see, you um, you know, these ideas, you know, expressed and then carried forward. Um, yeah, it's just brilliant, really brilliant. Thank you for sharing that with us as well, Jill. Yeah. Wow. And, you know, one of the things as well, um, um, so I'm going to start looking at his work because one of the things as a New York designer or as a, a designer in London, many of these uh, kinds of designers have been written out of, um, you know, the various na narratives. And mm. um, I'm looking at an image now, and this is why, well, you know, it is, it is there's a sadness that um, Fran Francesca Cesani um, departed early, but because I'm looking at an image of her with him. Okay, okay. Yeah. Huh. So she invested her time in, um, in exploring African designers and getting to know kind of like who they were as well. So she had been engaged in, oh, she's now working on an art, okay. I would love to know more about that, uh, Jill. Maybe you could, in, you know, figure out if we could, I'm gonna put my email in here as well. I'd love to, I'd love to know more about arch the archiving of his work. Mm, that's quite interesting actually. Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's really good. Oh, wow, this is wonderful. Yeah. We need to find more ways to make sure that um, designers, um, black, African designers of color are included. Mm. Very good. Oh, I, I'm looking at his work now. Do we have any more questions? Or... I think that's it. Okay. And you said so much, do not so many gems to take away from anything else. <laughs> this has really been, it has been amazing. Thank yeah. you. So well, thank you. For having you and thank you for letting us letter, uh, letter for organizing this. Um, yes, this most, part of most, this. most definitely. Um, you know, just to say, you know, to the, uh, the Leather Fair, uh, Nigeria Leather Fair, um, I am, you know, very, very interested to see how we can, you know, keep on expanding this um, conversation and um, to look at where, where, what's the next level, where do you want to go to, how, you know, we can create different kind of collaborations or partnerships, most definitely I am super That's interested good. in, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Exciting. Look forward to many more sort of collaborations yeah thank you and Lani thank you for being just a you know such a great um host as well and um um like I'm going to take another look at your work as well uh do you do you have um are you where are you selling mainly in the in Nigeria or where else where else we're boutique but we sell we sell um wherever the client is interested yeah right okay Right. I'll keep taking a look. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you as well. Thank you so much for joining. Thanks again, Lady Thank yes. you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, it has been a pleasure uh, to join you. So, yeah.
on to my next meeting then. Okay. <laughs> Take care. <laughs> Have a good day. All right. Stay you safe. too. <laughs> you, you as well. Take care. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. Bye.